the story of the forest is one you could easily miss the majority of. It isn't told through frequent cutscenes or dialogues, instead the forest story is told through its environment, and to experience it you must seek it out. So while on the surface it goes plane crash into your son being abducted, to you surviving and rescuing your son, there's a bit more than that, so let's jump on into it. The peninsula in which our story takes place is likely somewhere within the country of Canada, and it begins in the distant past. First inhabiting this peninsula was an unknown ancient civilization, which boasted either an incredibly advanced technology or supernatural abilities. Before disappearing from history, these ancient ones left behind two obelisks of great power. One in fact called the Power Obelisk, and the other the Resurrection Obelisk. Though as we'll soon learn, interacting with these obelisks incurs pretty dramatic and devastating effects, including, but not limited to, altering DNA and creating an array of different genetic mutations in humans. And while these ancient ones would leave the peninsula for whatever reason they did, the land would not be uninhabited. Tribes of cannibalistic humans have made their home within the peninsula and the systems of caves that run beneath it. And while it's unknown for how long they've been here or who exactly they are, it's likely they've been here for quite a while, and some even speculate that they themselves have become some form of mutant from worshipping and or residing near the obelisks. Even if these cannibals underwent genetic mutations, it's quite reserved in comparison to some of the other mutations rendered by the obelisks. And scattered across the peninsula are remnants of many different visitors across a vast stretch of time. From many modern campsites sited around the forest, to a decades old yacht, to an older Roman Catholic missionary camp likely arriving in the late 19th or early 20th century. I believe that because these visitors, for the most part, can't be found and most of what remains behind our traces lends to the idea that those dwelling for too long near the obelisks became the cannibalistic mutants that inhabit the peninsula. Well, at least the ones that weren't eaten and or brutalized. But things would begin to go even further south on the peninsula when it was purchased by a company called Sahara Therapeutics, who had somehow learned of the capabilities of the obelisks. They erected labs high above and far below the mountain harboring these obelisks to begin conducting experiments on eternal life and resurrection while harnessing these unknown powers. Sahara Therapeutics would eventually market their research to the public in a program called the Jarius Project, with the aim of healing terminally ill children. This project was headed by a man named Dr. Matthew Cross, who would go on to become the main antagonist of our story. Dr. Cross was eventually terminated from his position with Sahara Therapeutics, as his experiment on children had begun yielding results in which they were mutated into varying monstrosities. As it's believed he was sacrificing live children to power the resurrection obelisk to return the dead back to life. There are a few important events to cover that happened with Dr. Cross, but it's hard to determine exactly when they occurred within the time frame of him working on the Jarius project and being relieved of his duty. Just bear that in mind as we go over the details. Dr. Cross had a daughter named Emily who was one of the terminally ill children eventually brought to the peninsula in hopes of being cured. But before that, he was married to a woman named Jessica, and the two things we know definitively about her is that she filed a restraining order at some point against Dr. Cross, stating that he is to have no contact with her or their daughter Emily, citing his aggravated stalking or harassments as grounds for the order. The other thing we know for certain is that according to an autopsy report, Three months after filing the restraining order, Jessica was murdered. I believe the working theory, and the most logical, is that Dr. Cross and Jessica had vastly different opinions on how best to approach their daughter's terminal illness. Dr. Cross, obviously keen on the power of the obelisks being enough to save Emily, and Jessica in stark opposition of that. Tensions rose, the restraining order was filed, and eventually Dr. Cross murdered Jessica and absconded to the peninsula with Emily. The experiments would begin, children would become genetically deformed monsters, and eventually all hell would break loose in the labs when one of these mutants, labeled as an Armsy, escaped from its containment, trampling over Emily and killing her before rampaging throughout the lab. Emily's death would drive Dr. Cross even further into madness, 
The lab was either abandoned or everyone else was killed, genetic monstrosities were loose all over the peninsula, and his daughter was dead. But Dr. Cross knew of the power of the Resurrection Obelisk, knew that if he could find a live child to sacrifice, he could bring Emily back to life. So, using the power of the Power Obelisk, Dr. Cross brings down a plane flying over the peninsula in hopes of retrieving the child he needs to bring back Emily. This just so happens to be our player character's plane, a man named Eric LeBlanc, a famed survival documentary host and author to the survival guide we use throughout the game, flying home with his son Timmy. The Power Obelisk brings the plane down, and we watch as Dr. Cross, now completely covered in red paint, likely as a way to move throughout or control the cannibal tribes, take our son Timmy from the wreckage and into the forest. It's unknown how long it takes us to track Timmy down and find him, as the game is more so centered on being a survival game than a straightforward story. But eventually we find and fight our way to the remains of the Sahara Therapeutics Lab and to the Resurrection Obelisk, where we find Timmy's lifeless body, as we were too late to stop Dr. Cross from using the obelisk to resurrect Emily. But like with countless others, the obelisk's power are truly unknown to us, and the results are devastating. And what Dr. Cross brought back to life wasn't quite his daughter. This is illustrated by Emily's drawings we find, and Dr. Cross's dead body impaled with crowns. Well, that and when we find Emily, she begins seizing uncontrollably and transforms into a monstrous mutant. Eric soon learns that he can't use Emily with the resurrection obelisk to bring Timmy back to life as it needs a live sacrifice in order to do so. Further into the lab, Eric discovers how the power obelisk was used to bring down their plane, and puts together that's how Dr. Cross planned to bring his child back to life. Eric realizes that he can likewise resurrect Timmy by bringing down a plane and taking a surviving child from the wreckage to sacrifice. And so he does. star, author, and real-life plane crash survivor. Here to talk to us about his new book, Rescue, along with his son, Timmy. Please, give it up for Eric LeBlanc. Nice to meet you, man. That's one hell of a story. So let's jump right into it. You've written a harrowing tale of survival and adventure with a plane crash. Look, you can see it on the cover. I feel like you're really blurring the lines here between fact and fiction. Oh, is that yes? Hey, do y'all want a demonstration? Okay, we've got a setup right over here. Come on, don't leave me hanging. Come on, everyone. All of you want to see this too, right? What do you say? Come on, everyone. Yes! All right. Grab Timmy and let's head on over. Watch your step now. I got my axe. Where do you hold this thing? Oh, oh like this? Here we go. Okay. 